Chapter 6 Characteristics of the Last Days 2 Timothy 3 verses 1-9 In his first epistle to Timothy, as we have seen, Paul speaks of the latter times and he depicts conditions that have long since been fulfilled, conditions, however, which were still far in the future when he wrote. He said, In the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. We have only to look back into what we speak of as the Dark Ages to recognize the fulfillment of these words. We have it in the Romish apostasy, in looking upon an unmarried nun or a celibate monk as a holier person than the Christian wife and mother, or husband and father. Commanding to abstain from meats, as though these were conducive to lead one into sin, and the abstinence from them had a tendency to make one holier. We know how all that has been fulfilled. And now we come farther along the stream of time. We come to our own times, the last days of this second epistle. In order to give a somewhat fuller exposition of this passage than time permitted in the oral address, I have substituted a portion of my book, The Midnight Cry. Paul says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be self-lovers, money-lovers, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, unforgiving, false accusers, incontinent, savage, haters of good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they who creep into houses, and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with manifold desires, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Jans and Jambers withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all, as theirs also was. Verses 1-9, 1911 Version these are the great outstanding features of the last days, closing the church dispensation and to be immediately followed by the coming of the Lord. Can any believer in holy writ doubt our being now in the very midst of them? But it may be here objected, when have men in general been other than as here depicted? Is not this but a repetition of what Paul has already said in describing the heathen world in his day, Romans 1 verses 29-32? In what special sense are they any more characteristic now than then? To these very natural queries I reply that such things, indeed, ever describe the heathen, but in 2 Timothy 3 the Holy Spirit is describing conditions in the professing church in the last days. It is not the openly wicked and godless who are being depicted here. It is those who have a form of godliness while denying its power. This is what makes the passage so intensely solemn and gives it such tremendous weight in the present day. There are 21 outstanding features in this prophecy of church conditions in the last days, and that each may have its due weight with my reader I touch briefly on them in order. 1. Men shall be self-lovers. It is men self-occupied, as contrasted with the godly of all ages who found their joy and delight in looking away from self to God as seen in Christ. This is the age of the egotist in matters spiritual as well as carnal. They find their God within them, we are told, and not without they make no secret of it. When they profess to love God, it is themselves they love. 2. Money lovers. Is it necessary to speak of this? Colossal fortunes heaped together by men who profess to believe the Bible and its testimony. What a spectacle for angels and demons! There was one Simon Magus of old. He has myriads of successors in the professing church today, and the command not to eat with a covetous man or an extortioner is in most places a dead letter indeed. 3. Boasters. Read the so-called Christian papers, attend Christendom's great conventions of young people or old. Listen to the great pulpiteers of the day. What is their theme? Rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Great swelling words are rapturously applauded by people dwelling in a fool's paradise, even when uttered by men who are tearing the Bible to shreds, and who deny practically every truth that it contains. 4. Proud. So proud as to glory in their shame, congratulating themselves on the very things the Word of God so unsparingly condemns. Proud of their fancied superiority, proud of their eloquence, proud of their miscalled culture, 
proud of their very impiety, which is hailed as the evidence of broad-mindedness and a cultivated intellect. How nauseating it must all be to him who said, Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. 5. Blasphemers. Yes, there it is, that big, ugly word that one hesitates to use, but which is chosen by the Holy Spirit himself to describe the men drawing salaries as ministers of Christ who use their office to impiously deny his name. Blasphemers. I, the whole host of the new theologians, miscalled higher critics, and all their ilk all who deny the deity of the Son, his virgin birth, his holy humanity, blasphemers, every one, and as such to be judged unsparingly in the harvest of wrath so near at hand. And think of the disloyalty to Christ of Christians, real Christians, I mean, who can sit and listen to such men week after week and are too timid to protest, or too indifferent to obey the word, from such turn away. 6. Disobedient to Parents it is one of the crowning sins of the age and indicates the soon breaking up of the whole social fabric as at present constituted. Opposition to authority is undoubtedly one of the characteristic features of the time. Children will not brook restraint, and parents have largely lost the sense of their responsibility toward the rising generation. Does this seem unduly pessimistic? Nevertheless, a little thoughtful consideration will, I am sure, convince any reasonable person of its truth. And it may be laid down as an axiom that children not trained in obedience to parents will not readily be obedient to God. We have been sowing the wind in this respect for years, as nations and as families. The reaping of the whirlwind is certain to follow. 7. Unthankful. It is the denial of divine providence utterly forgetting the source of all blessings, both temporal and spiritual. Straws indicate the turn of the wind, and even so small a matter, as some may call it, as the giving up of the good old-fashioned and eminently scriptural custom of thanksgiving at the table, we may see how prevalent is the sin of unthankfulness among professed Christians. Go into the restaurants or other eating houses. How often can you tell the believer from the unbeliever? 8. Unholy. The godly separation from the world according to the Bible is sneered at as bigotry and puritanism. In its place has come a jolly, rollicking worldliness that ill comports with the Christian profession. Piety, the characteristic Christian virtue, how little seen now. It is not necessary to be outwardly vile to be unholy. Giving up the line of separation between the believer and the unbeliever is unholiness. 9. Without natural affection. The foundations of family life are being destroyed. Unscriptural divorces and all their kindred evils cast their dark shadows over the professing church, as well as over the body politic. On the next unholy octave I need not dwell particularly. To enumerate them is enough to stir the heart and appall the soul when it is remembered how they are tolerated and spreading through the great professing body. 10. Unforgiving 11. False accusers, let us beware lest we be found almost unwittingly in this satanic company. 12. Incontinent. 13. Savage. 14. Haters of good. 15. Traitors. 16. Heady. 17. High minded. This last accounts largely for the daring things proudly uttered by learned doctors against Scripture and the great fundamentals of the faith, and complacently accepted by unregenerate hearers. Surely, the time has come when they will not bear sound teaching but according to their own desire shall heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, 2 Timothy 4 verse 3, 1911 version. 18. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Would you not almost think the words were written by some fiery-souled exhorter of the present day? How aptly they characterize in one brief clause the greatest outstanding feature of the religious world. The Church of God has gone into the entertainment business. People must be amused, and as the church needs the people's money, the church must, perforce, supply the demand and meet the craving. How else are godless hypocrites to be held together? How otherwise can the throngs of unconverted youths and maidens be attracted to the services? So the picture show and the entertainment, in the form of musical, sacred, perhaps, and minstrel show, take the place of the gospel address and the solemn worship of God. And thus Christless souls are lulled to sleep and made to feel religious while gratifying every carnal desire under the sanction of the sham called the church. And the end? What an awakening!
19. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Men must have some form of religious expression, and so the outward thing is sustained after the life is gone out of it. Thus formality prevails where regeneration, conversion to God, the Spirit's sanctification, and everything really vital has long since been virtually denied. The bulk of so-called church members do not even profess to have been saved or to be spirit indwelt. All this is foreign to their mode of thought or speech. The gospel, which alone is the power of God unto salvation, is seldom preached and, by the mass, never missed. Could declension and apostasy go much further? Yet there are still lower depths to be sounded. 20. Feminism. No, you will not find the word, but read verse 6 again, slowly and thoughtfully. Does it not indicate a great feminist movement in these dark days? Silly women, laden with manifold desires, craving what God in his infinite wisdom has forbidden them, authority, publicity, masculinity, and what not. Thus they leave their own estate and make a new religion to suit themselves. Is it a matter of no import that just such emotional women were the tools used by Satan for the starting and propagating of so many modern fads? Need one mention Madame Blavatsky, Besant, and Tingley of Theosophy? the Fox sisters' relation to modern spiritism, Mrs. Mary Baker Glover Eddy and her host of female practitioners in the woman's religion miscalled Christian Science, the neurotic Ellen G. White and her visionary system of Seventh-day Adventism, Ella Wheeler Wilcox and her associates in the spreading of what they have been pleased to denominate the new thought, which is only the devil's old lie, you shall be as gods, in a modern garb, and the women expounders of the silent unity, or home of truth delusions, all these are outside the orthodox fold. But when we look within, what a large place has the modern feminist movement secured in the affections of women who profess to believe the Bible, but who unblushingly denounce Paul as an old bachelor with narrow, contracted ideas, little realizing that they are thereby rejecting the testimony of the Holy Spirit. It is one of the signs of the times, and clearly shows toward what the professing body is so rapidly drifting. 21. 21. Ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, and that by their own confession. They are truth seekers. Ask them if it be not so. They confess it without a blush and consider it humility thus to speak. According to these apostates, the church which began as the pillar and ground of the truth is, in this twentieth century of its existence, seeking the truth, thereby acknowledging they never yet have found it. Truth seekers. Yet the Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14 verse 6. Why then seek further? Because they have drifted away from him and his word, so they go on, ever learning, ever seeking, and ever missing the glorious revelation of the truth as it is in Jesus. Well, this is the end. Declension can go no further than to deny the Lord that bought them, until he himself shall remove his own to the Father's house. Then the apostate body remaining will declare, We have found the truth at last, and they will worship the Antichrist, believing the devil's lie and calling it the truth. And how comes such delusion? And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all might be judged who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness, 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 11-12, emphasis added, 1911 version. As for those who have been the leaders in turning others from the truth, what will happen to them? Now as Jans and Jambers withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. That is, in due time God is going to deal in judgment with those who mislead the ignorant and unwary, and who turn them unto fables which encourage them to live in sin and follow after the lusts of the flesh. This is God's picture of the last days. And I challenge you to look about you and see if these are not the conditions that characterize a great part of Christendom today, no reality, no power, yet much profession. God give us to be genuine, to be real, that eternal things may so grip our souls that we will live and do the work and be real witnesses for him.